Uh, this time of our service, we're going to do uh, our communion, which will prepare our time for communion. So if you have a, a, a plastic cup with the bread and the juice nearby, please uh, hang on to that. We'll be able to celebrate and, and uh, take part of the Lord's Supper together. Uh, we are continuing our series called Reimagine and how we can reimagine our relationship with God and particularly how we approach him uh, by looking at specific postures that you and I have or develop uh, in ways that we try to make sense of our relationship with God or perhaps in ways that are in alignment with scripture and perhaps if you're like me in, in ways that we uh, kind of make up <laughs> uh, in our way to approach God. Last, uh, last Sunday we looked at life over God where we can use God's principles uh, in a way to manipulate in the sense that we want God's principles, the natural laws of the world. In a sense, a uh, simple illustration is God has given us his word. He's given us the owner's manual, the basic instructions before leaving earth uh, acronym. And we want all those. So you know what? Thanks for giving us all those principles. It's up to us now to find those principles and to put them into practice. And if we do that, life should go well. So it's a, in a way, we thank you for your principles, God, but I'm not really looking to connect with you primarily. So we want his... We want, his, we want his knowledge and his wisdom, but we don't want him, per se. So today we'll look at another uh, posture, and today's posture is life from God. Life from God. Uh, Christian sociologists at the wonderful University of Chapel Hill, U the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, I was just down there yesterday, uh, studied the lives of teenagers for years, which sounds like a riveting study already. Uh, they concluded that most of them view God as a combination of the following two things, a divine butler and a cosmic therapist. I don't know. I, I can see him that way too sometimes. I don't know. I guess you don't have to be a teen to think that way. I guess that's the point of the study. Uh, God does, in, in their minds, exist to help them through their problems and to help them achieve what they desire. Their primary concern, according to the study, was with one's own happiness instead of glorifying God or learning to follow him or even how they can serve others with their gifts and talents. So in a sense, if you were to splice open the universe, you would find yourself in the middle. So you are the center of the universe in a sense of this life from God approach. Uh, you add in all of that, and I think we can relate to that to a degree, but you also add in that you and I live and swim and breathe this consumer worldview that our world actually exists in such a way to create in all of us a need that becomes, or excuse me, a want that essentially becomes a need. So I know if you're a parent, you might say to yourself or to your children, do you really need that? And your child might respond or you may respond to yourself in these, you know, little monologue in your mind. Uh, no, I just want that. No, 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 actually I really need that. And we can go from a want and then over time convince ourselves it's a real need. And the reality is this world exists and particularly capitalism and consumerism mentality here in America and the Western world, marketing is to convince you that you want this and then to somehow bring you to a place where not only do you want it, you actually need this. You need this. You cannot exist. Your life will not be as rich, as fulfilling. It won't be as easy. You won't have what you deserve unless you have this. And that can be different for all of us. You know, we, we might fall hook, line, and sinker for a certain type of cereal, like Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Like, it's not a real need uh, to you, but it is to me. Somehow it went from a want to a need. And uh, we might feel that way about our phones. Some of us who are old enough to remember what it was like to not have a phone, uh, we did fine, right? We did fine with the answer machines. Uh, in a lot of ways, bring it back. Like, you're untouchable until you're at home. That's a beautiful thing, right? Now they'll hunt you down and, and kill you, right? Anyway, with your phones. But uh, we, we have those, we look back, and a lot of it's good, but uh, all of us have bought into a consumer mentality to some degree that I had a need or I had a want and now it's a need. And that's what we're swimming in. According to the New York Times, this is back in 2011, so maybe multiply this by 10. In 2011, the New York Times said that each person is exposed to over 3,500 desire-inducing advertisements every day. 3,500, 3,500 desire-inducing advertisements. And that's 2011. So I think we can say it's probably more now, yes? 
in 2023. So we all go to school of insatiability, meaning you can't ever have enough, right? It's insatiable. You get one, one thing and now you need another one, right? Like iPhone, the original iPhone, like you wouldn't be caught dead with that thing in your hand. I have a friend, he, he's up in our Blue Ridge Church. He's a great friend of mine and, and Greg, a lot of you guys know him. His name is Bobby Pearson. And uh, smart guy, UVA grad, uh, incredible, incredible, incredible brother, spiritual, godly, but very smart. Uh, we both served at camp in Philadelphia this summer. And uh, we, we have this thing called Group Me. If you guys are familiar with Group Me, it's basically like a group message uh, application. And we get all the counselors on one Group Me so that I send one message as the director and everybody gets it. It's a real easy way to communicate when we're all, all, all over camp. So I thought that was pretty straightforward. Bobby comes up to me at the end of our director's meeting and, and counselor's meeting, he goes, hey, um, I, I don't have Group Me. I was like, oh, no sweat, man. Just go to your app store and download it. And he just reaches it into his pocket and he goes, and he has this flip phone. And I was like, what is that, man? And he's like, hey, man, this is my flip phone. I love this thing. So he's, he's holding on uh, for dear life. So we just did the old-fashioned thing. Just, we just called each other. How about that? Like, whoa, that was crazy. Uh, we just called. But it, 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 it was funny to see the flip phone. So he's, he's fought off a lot of the, uh, the need to want or the wants to need. Good for him. Uh, but we are taught in our, in our world to never be satisfied. We're tutored to believe that life consists of unmet needs that can be met by good and fulfilling experiences. So you might not have what you need, but you know what, there's an experience, so there's something out there for you that can help you really experience life more fully. So Americans, I believe, or Westerners, we chase after experiences. And unfortunately, church and God and community can actually fall in that same category where we're chasing experiences we come to church for an experience we we worship for an experience we we follow uh, personalities and pastors and preachers for experiences and uh, you're here so I know that's not you but uh, but you have all that going and that, that's true you know you, you follow people follow sports teams that win like nobody wants to follow a sports team that loses unless you know, we could throw some teams out there in the local area. Uh, but anyway, you add that, that, com that culture with a sinful nature that all of us have, which we need the Holy Spirit to have, self-control. We don't have that without the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So you add in the reality that you and I lack self-control without the help of God intervening in us. And self-control has always plagued humanity. And then you throw in a culture that you and I swim in, an economic system that relies on it, and bada boom, bada bing, we are people who chase after what stuff can I get from this experience? And what do I not have that I need? And when I get that, I will be fill in the blank until I'm not, and then there's something else that we run after. And that's who we all are. So admit it, and we need help with it, amen? And if you and I, honestly, decided to, you know what, not be that way, our economy might darn near collapse. I'm not saying that's what we're trying to do, but if people all of a sudden said, you know what, I don't need that, and stopped all the consumerism that we fall into, yeah. it, it might be different around here. We don't necessarily want that. We do believe that some consumption is for the betterment of all around us, uh, big proponent in small businesses, all that kind of stuff. But that's not why we gathered here this morning. The question is, does consumerism define you, define your life? And if it does, you might find yourself in this life from God posture. Now, Greg and I didn't talk this morning, but uh, Luke 15 is the passage that I'm jumping into here. And I believe Luke 15 is a great parable that highlights the parable of the prodigal son of the two sons. That Luke 15, if you want to flip over there, if you have a Bible, you're near someone who does. Uh, Luke 15 is a familiar parable. But as Greg mentioned in his, in his contribution, it's, it's, two, it's two sons who have a relationship with a father. Father is, uh, is, is, in this parable, is God. But there's a younger son that gets a lot, of the, a lot of the press. He wants his inheritance from his father. And he gets it, and he goes off and spoils it with lavish living to the point where he has nothing. He desires to eat the pods that the pigs are eating. And he comes to his senses, and he returns to his father in a sense that, you know what, I can come back 
and I'm not worthy to be his son, but you know what? His slaves or his hired, hired people live a better life than what I've got going on. And that inheritance, we know, if you know a little bit of the history there, that inheritance wasn't just like, hey, yeah, I saved up in a 529 for your college account. Here you go. That was always for you. The inheritance only happens when the father passes away. So for the younger son to say, I want my inheritance, is a loud poster sign that says, I wish you were dead. I don't want you. I don't even care about you. I don't care about you being my father. I just want my, your stuff. So this, this highlights a life from God. Uh, mentality or posture is that I'm not necessarily in it for the relationship with God. I'm in it for what he provides for me. I'm in it for his stuff. I'm not in it for him. And the older son, excuse me, the younger son gets a lot of that uh, obvious connection. But the reality is the parable was told by Jesus to religious people. It wasn't to the people, the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors that were running about doing these things. It was actually told to the people who thought they had a relationship with God. And he told them that parable, and the kicker, the punchline, wasn't necessarily the younger son, it was the older son. The older son who did everything, who was there, who did not go off and live lavishly. And when the younger son comes back, he's irritated with the father for how he uses his stuff. He uses the inheritance that remains to throw a huge party that Greg mentioned in the contribution a big feast, a fattened calf, a ring, a robe. And the, younger, uh, the older son is furious because he's deciding to use the inheritance money to welcome back this sinner. So while we may think the younger son is uh, all about the party life and all about stuff, the older son reveals his true heart in the same way when he gets angry with how God decides to use his stuff. And I think so much, so much in his heart was, I want your stuff too. I'm just working a different way to get it. The younger son wants all the stuff. And he's going to go and reject his relationship with the father. The younger son also rejects the relationship with the father, but he decides to stay in his good graces and wait his time out. And I think a lot of that, we can find ourselves in one of those two categories, where in our hearts, you know what? Yeah, I, I'm not really into God, but I hope he does this for me. I'm not really in a relationship with God, but I hope he takes care of my family, he gives me a great job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think for so many of us, and my heart included, we can find ourselves in the older son's position where we recognize that it's better to be in the house of God than it is to be out there. It's wiser to stay with the Father than to go out and try to do it on your own. We, some of us have lived that life and realized, no, 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 that, that doesn't work. It is actually better to be with God, even if it is trying to, trying to do stuff that he wants me to do so that my life goes better. We realize in the grand scheme of things, that seems quote unquote better, but the heart is still the same. Why are you here? What do you value? What do you really want? And a life from God posture says, I value your things, God, and what you can do for me, I don't necessarily value you. There's an old advertisement, it's old now, but it's, uh, it's UPS, what can Brown do for you, right? And that's the same mentality of a life from God. What can God do for you? Maybe more familiar is what have you done for me lately? And that mentality can be true of my relationship with God. Yes, you did this and that was awesome, I'm so grateful, but now I'm in this circumstance. Now I'm in the teenage years with my kids. What are you gonna do for me now? Now I'm, I'm battling some health challenges. What are you going to do for me now? I know you did that back in the day. You did that with so-and-so. That's awesome. Thank you, God. But now are you gonna do, what are you going to do now? And we'll talk through all those things this morning here. God's heart towards us is more than we could ever ask or imagine. God's love for us is so deep and so tender and so purposeful and so fulfilling it's more than we ever could ask or imagine. However, it doesn't always seem that way. It doesn't always feel that way. And the truth is, we don't always value it that way. That we value other things. That other things are going to give us purpose, meaning, fulfillment. And that's the challenge that all of us live in. Life for God, or life from God, makes receiving God's gifts the entirety of your religious life. It's an extreme, pro, an extreme posture that often is 
categorized in our evangelical world as the health and wealth gospel. You guys ever heard of that before? And the health and wealth gospel, honestly, if you break it down, it's really appealing. Because all it is, is God will hook you up and you don't have to change. You don't have to do anything. God is here as your cosmic therapist and your cosmic genie to give you what you ask. And he's not really asking much of you. He just wants you to believe that he can do that for you. Ever heard of that? Ever approach God that way? Now the challenge is, God does ask us to seek him. He does ask us to ask him for things. So what we desire and what we seek and what we do says a lot about how we view God. I think I have a, yeah, there, there it is. That's a, that's a real bumper sticker there. Provided by Jesus. So you can slap that on your, in your vehicle. And some of our, you know, the vehicles are, really need Jesus to keep running. Uh, but this was actually, I didn't, I, you know, broke, broke it off of a nice uh, brand new uh, BMW, like 8 Series or whatever, provided by Jesus. And it's a, it's, a, it's a loud advertisement that, you know what, wealth comes from the Lord. And they're not wrong. But in a sense that this elevates, man, he must be, he must be doing something awesome with God to be able to get that. And there's a lot of churches that are meeting right now that uh, look, that if I don't have the right suit, or if I don't have the right car, or I don't have the right position in my job, then you know what? I'm missing out on God's blessings, and there's something wrong with me. It's the reason why it's not. And churches are operated on that sometimes, where it's the sense that, you know what? If you would just obey, then you would kind of get to my level. You would have the Mercedes Benz. You wouldn't have that sickness anymore. You would be married, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all based on God is here to just hook you up. All you got to do is just do what he wants, and you're good to go. So we approach God with, okay, God, I want your stuff, I want your stuff, I want your stuff. But we don't necessarily want him. So in our lives, it's time to think and to consider why we want what we want. You know, consider how you shop. I'll consider how I shop. Little thought is given to the story behind the product. Some of us are very conscientious and good, good on you as to who made that product, what lives are affected by this product. Some of you all will not shop at certain stores because certain people are impacted by them, and, and kudos to you. But for me, unfortunately, you know, if I want Pop-Tarts, I don't care who made the Pop-Tarts, where the Pop-Tarts came from. Um, if the Pop-Tarts are made in some developing country, I, I mean, I should care, but in the moment, I want Pop-Tarts, and it's, a, it's an impulse buy. They're never really on the grocery list, and I got, I got some the other day, and I, I hide them in the Lazy Susan in my house. Not from, you know, for people to look at me with shame, just so no one takes them. I'm, I'm proud of my Pop-Tarts. Strawberry, anyway. But these items pop up on, you know, pop up on your feed, pop up on your Amazon wish list, and you know what, you can click on that and it'll be sent to you to your door in two days or less. And unfortunately about that, not only do we not give thought behind the product, but we also don't think, we don't, we don't think, you know what, okay, this product's great, but it's only great until what? It's not. It's only great until it's no longer useful. And unfortunately, that same mindset can be appropriate to our relationship with God. And worse off, and, or in some, in some ways, it can be applied to people. You know, think about this in our world. When a marriage is no longer satisfying my desires, I can end it and try a new one. When a church community is no longer meeting my needs, I'll attend a different one. That same mentality, tragically, today, 2023, 2023, there are more men, women, and children in slavery today than any other time in our history. There are over 27 million people that are enslaved today. Slavery, sex trafficking, euthanasia, genocide, those things are only possible when people are seen as commodities to be measured by their usefulness and not by their inherent worth. So we say, whoa, it's, it's awful, that's awful. But the same mentality, the same mentality of things that life Life is about giving me things to be used. And God is in control of that. That's the life from God approach. That God, even God himself, has no inherent value. 
He's only as valuable by his usefulness. How useful God is to me is how useful God is. So some of us may say, God is super useful. God is super amazing because we have all these things. Other, other people may say, I don't believe in God. Well, why not? It's usually because they lack something or something happened traumatically or tragically to someone they know or even to themselves. That's how we can view God. And I'm not saying it's, it's, it's difficult. We all are here. I think this posture can reflect all of us. Religion or your relationship with God can be a means to an end, a spiritual method of achieving desire. This is all life from God. You know, one of my favorite songs is by Maverick City, and it's called Jaira, which means God is provider. And he is our almighty provider. But he is many things. He is not just a provider. He is many things. But in that song, in the lyric, is that he is enough. He is enough. He is enough. So if he's just the provider, yeah, but he is enough. He has provided himself, and that's enough. That's where we all want to be. That's where I believe God wants us to go, is that he is enough, that I pursue him, not just what he does. But that what he does is great, but that, that inspires me to who he is and to want him more, not just want his stuff. We don't want to look at God one-dimensionally, that God gives and we receive. That's missing the big picture altogether. I mentioned this earlier, but not everything we seek is selfish. But what is the object of our desire? Matthew 7, you can scribble these down, Matthew 7, 7 through 12, gives us this tremendous promise, one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture, that if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, it'll be given to you. And if you knock, the door will be opened. God is telling us there, ask me, come to me with your needs. Come to me. God's not there like, no, 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 don't ask for nothing. I'm here. That's enough. He wants you to come to him. He invites you to ask. James 1, 17 says that everything draws its life from God, and every good and perfect gift comes from him. God gives good gifts. But what does it want us to recognize? It comes from him. We understand that. Luke 11, verse 8 is a parable about prayer where Jesus calls us to ask God what we ask for God or tell God what we need but not just tell him what to need what you need but to do it with shameless audacity i mean like do it in a way that's that makes everybody else around you uncomfortable that's how he wants us to approach him but in all of those things where it falls and where the challenge is this morning even in our hearts you know what okay i know that i'm not just in it for his stuff i'm not i know i want to be in it for God, I think it's important for us to recognize where things can slip to the side. And what, this can, what happens is that we begin to overemphasize a single aspect of our divine human relationship with God. That's overemphasize one specific thing that God has possibly done in our relationship with him. But when this becomes, whatever it may be, we'll talk about it, the entirety of how we relate to him, this is when we place ourselves in the middle of the universe. So let's look at a few things, how you know this posture is creeping in. You ready? The first one is how do you deal with pain and suffering? Nobody wants pain. Nobody wants suffering. How many of us sign up for that? Yes, give it to me. What's the hardest road? I'll take that. Now, we've been on hard roads, and we've all experienced pain or suffering. And hopefully at a point you get to, the, get to a place where you're like, okay, God, I know what God was up to in that. And it was hard, but he brought me to this place where you can actually experience loss and actually have life at the same time. That's only possible in God. Loss without God is just loss and loss and loss. Only with God can he bring something that's a loss and actually bring life through it. It's tremendous, but it's hard. And none of us really sign up uh, for those things. But how do you deal with fear and suffering? Uh, or excuse me, pain and suffering. Pain... Usually, when it's around, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the reality that something's wrong. If you're experiencing pain, you shouldn't be, right? That's almost inherent. Like, I'm experiencing pain. This shouldn't be happening. Suffering can be the same thing. We can suffer in all different ways, not just necessarily loss, but you can suffer 
from FOMO. Suffer from the fear of missing out. Like, I don't want to miss out. You can suffer through a mentality of scarcity, that you constantly live in a place where you don't believe you have enough or you won't have enough. Every day, it's like, okay, will I have enough? Will, will I have enough money? Will I have enough food? And those are real realities in our world. That's a real reality, not just in our world, right here in Roanoke. You can also have the pain and suffering of feeling and believing that you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not strong enough. You're not diligent enough. You're not disciplined enough. You're not talented enough. And you can walk through your life with the suffering that you just don't have what it takes. I'm the only one. You can believe that you can suffer through not feeling valuable. You can go through suffering in the sense that you're always going to fall behind. I don't know if, you, if anyone feels that way. It started in math class, and it continues through my life today. Like, I am going to fall behind. I'm going to fall behind. If I don't figure this out, I'm going to fall behind. You work so hard to not fall behind. And that can take shape in many different things. Fall behind in the ladder and where you should be in your job by now. You've worked here for five years. You should be here. Don't fall behind. You compare yourself to your neighbors. Well, they've been, they've been parents for this many years, and this is where their kids are. Don't fall behind. You can look at other, other married couples and say, okay, they've been married for five years, and now they already have a kid. We've been married for five years trying to have a kid, and we don't have one. We're falling behind. There's all this kind of stuff. As a single, you can look at it and say, okay, you know what? Maybe I don't want to be married, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show myself in this way with my job, my productivity, my ability, my financial wealth and stability, but then you find someone else that's got it going on more than you. <gasps> I'm falling behind. And it's a rat race out of the fear that I don't want to suffer from falling behind and what might be the consequences of that, whether real or made up in our minds. So unfortunately, the health and wealth gospel and a life from God, and whether that's preached or caught or taught, a great deal of contemporary religion is designed to help us not feel pain and suffering, to not express it, to not experience it, to push it away. In a lot of ways, when pain comes or we experience pain, contemporary religion wants you to avoid it, wants you to avoid it completely, wants you to say, ah, you know what, don't worry about that, just keep on, keep on moving. We might have uh, brothers and sisters right, right here, I've said it to some people, you have difficulty, like, hey, you know what, don't worry about it. Just trust God and keep moving. They're like, you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to stop and think about it. Just keep moving. And that's what a lot of contemporary religion can do. Contemporary religion can also just try to distract you from it. It numbs our fears and pains, but it does never, it actually never deals with them, never removes them. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Consumerism and life from God would have you put on your headphones and crank up the volume on your iPhones and Androids. And I went to India in 2004, and I did not know I was going to experience this, but we went to a leprosy colony. At the ripe old age of 19, I didn't know leprosy still existed in the world. That's how um, sheltered I was. But we went to India, and we went to a leprosy colony that was two, two hours away from Center City, out in a shanty town, where our uh, benevolent wing of our churches, Hope Worldwide, actually set up a community there to take care of over 100, 150 leprous people and their families. And what we were told we were going to do is we got together with uh, some of the doctors that were there, and they handed us masks and gloves, and then they handed us some gauze, some iodine, and scissors. And I was like, what are we doing? And they prepped us that we were going to actually uh, tend to these people that have had leprous, which uh, uh, the deadening of the, of the nerves, so they actually can't feel mostly all their extremities, nose, ears, hands, feet, so that when they cut themselves, they can't feel it, it gets infected, and they lose limbs. So the absence of pain to a leper is death. Life was found when they experienced pain. So those scissors were told to me, you're gonna use these scissors to cut away all the dead skin to a point where they start bleeding because that's where the nerves are 
so it can fire new growth. And I was like, wait, what? And I don't know the medical science behind that or if that was actually good, but we did it. And we had people coming to us with one, one finger, four fingers, three nubs, and they're handing their hands to us and we're cutting away all the dead skin and uh, making them bleed. And if I bleed, something's wrong. To them, this was the gateway to repair. This was the great way to life, to renewal. And there's something about that. And I'm not saying we need to go cause ourselves to bleed, but what I am saying is that pain isn't necessarily the enemy you think it is. Pain isn't necessarily something you should be working to avoid. Pain isn't something that you should say, you know what, if pain's happening or suffering's happening, that something's wrong and God is letting me down. You know, God uses scripture many a times in a, in a way that actually describes pain happening as a good thing. He says in Hebrews 4, God's word is like a double-edged sword. It cuts. It cuts to the innermost parts, dividing joints and marrow, soul and spirit. Why would God want to cut you? He's a surgeon. Something bad needs to come out. Something good needs to go in. Pain. He disciplines, Hebrews 12, disciplines those he loves. We think in a world with life from God, and we think in a world that, it's particularly in Westerners, that we're avoiding pain through consumption, through chasing after our, our goals and making uh, things the goal, that pain is always punitive. But in the case of these leprous people, pain is the direct line to life. God promised or God warned us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and this is from the message. He says, make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules, and regulations that I have commanded you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, build pleasant homes and settle in. See your herds and flocks flourish and more and more money coming in. Watch your standard of living go up and up. Make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God, your God the God who delivered you from Egyptian slavery. Comfort. Comfort was actually the fertile, the fertile ground to forget God. And God says, hey, you're going to get stuff. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to fulfill my promises to you by actually making your herds and your population, your people increase. I'm going to bless you to actually fulfill my will for you so that the world will know there is a God. But don't take the blessings and get comfortable and let's forget God. So our avoidance of pain and suffering is a pursuit of comfortability. That comfort e equals good. And comfort, in a lot of cases, is the pathway to stagnation, backsliding, and in many cases, forgetting God altogether. The scripture goes on, I'm not going to read it, but you can read it at verse 12, verse 13. It gets to a point where the people start to think they did it. They were the ones that made all these things happen. So that's where life from God goes, is that, God, please, you're here to give me things. But once those things come and once you get the fulfillment, you start to deceive yourself to think, you know what, I did this. And God is just, again, just someone who's meant to keep you getting what you want. So God's stuff over God, just like the two brothers in Luke 15. Uh, author and preacher Timothy Keller wrote in his book, Counterfeit Gods. Definitely recommend that book, Counterfeit Gods. He defines idols as good things turned into ultimate things. So Jesus confronts this tendency in us with this life from God, is that we think, okay, you know what? You give me these blessings, they become the ultimate thing that we hold on to. Matthew 10, 37 confronts this when Jesus says in regards to following him, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus confronts this mentality of life from God, that your items, your life, your circumstances, your things, if you love them more than him, you have no relationship with him. You can't be a disciple of Jesus if you love something else more than God. And that's constantly in competition, isn't it? And it's not only that, it's just the, the abundance of things actually can get in the way of us loving God first and foremost. 
So God tells us, you know what? The world says, you got all this stuff going on. You've got real life going on. God says, you got all this stuff going on. You better be careful. You might not have life at all. And that's the dangers of us seeking wealth, comfortable homes, a stellar reputation, you name it, all good things, but if they're the ultimate thing, you have no life. You have no life. So many of us have been in a situation where we know someone or we are those people. We run around so much to maintain our livelihood that we have no time for relationships. Zip. I've got two kids that are in sports. It is very, very common as we look over our week that our week is so structured already that we've got no time for interruptions. We've got no time for relationships outside of what we've decided to plug ourselves into. Now we have relationships within those things, but it creates this relationship with our schedule that, you know what, this, this is how we have life. But then there's plenty of times we see our friends or we sit down and we're like, we don't have a life. We don't have a life outside of this, running our kids to practices. I have no life, what happened? But we have pursued so many things from the outside. Look at them, nice house, kids playing sports, da 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 What a life. And we feel like, what kind of life is this? So don't get duped into thinking the more you got going on, means the more life you have. In all honesty, the opposite can be true. But again, none of those things are bad. Get your kids in sports. In my opinion, it's better than the Xbox. Go, get them outside. Get them on a bike, go for it. The question here for us to think about is do we really want God himself? That's it. Do we want God himself? We have a culture that tells us to focus on material things and less and less on relationships. No matter how well you orchestrate your life, you can't prevent pain and suffering from coming. It will come. And when those times come, it does give us a look into what we're really all about. But God has called us, as we take communion here, God has called us to himself. He's not called us to, to base our lives based on our circumstances or the radical decisions that give, us our, that give our lives meaning. He's called us to unity with himself. God has not called you to be a disciple for being a disciple's sake. He's not called you to be committed to him for commitment's sake. He has called you to himself. Life is not obtained with the multitude of possessions, and life is not obtained with a multitude of obedience to a commitment. Life is obtained if you have God. That's where life is. So what brings a person value is God. What brings a person significance is God. What brings a person's real hope is not what they do, but with whom they do it. That's what we focus on. The call that God has given us is not to get life from what he gives you. He's calling you to come to him for life. He's called you to live in continual communion with him through all that you do. So if you have a great job, awesome, commune with God there. If you have a decent job and you want a better job, okay, go get a better job, but life is not in that better job. Life is with God in the crappy job you have and the better job you have next. That's where it is. So much of our world says you are called to better circumstances. Go to that circumstance, go to that job, go to that neighborhood, go to that state, go to that school, go to that fitness club. That's where life is, no, 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 no. Wherever you are, that's where God will be. Take him with you. He wants to be in continual communion with you through the hardships and the great moments. Godliness is great gain. Godliness is great gain. Changing your circumstances is not the gateway to life. Changing who you're with, particularly with God, is the path to life. Write this down. We don't have time. 1 Corinthians 7. Paul tells the people there about their desires to change their circumstances. God says, stay where you are, where you are called. If you can get freedom, cool, but stay where you are when you're called. Meaning, me with you, my calling to you is the greatest gift I can give you. Not your circumstances, not a change in your situation, but being great is with me. 
Paul in Philippians 3, 7 says the same things. Whatever gains I had, loss in comparison to what? The last situation in comparison to my neighbor, the Joneses? No. This all lost in comparison to what? Knowing Christ. You know, this church, so proud of it, even as, as Greg mentioned, our special missions contribution, that's just building, building a, a fund to help meet needs to see God's kingdom grow. It's, it's something that we want to do. It's something you guys have committed to do. And it's, it's, it's the evidence of a church that's not living life from God, that believes that even losing, losing financial money actually is the gateway to life. Everything on the outside says hoard it. That's life. Giving it actually is what brings life. And the only way that comes about is that you know that God treasures you more than anything. Luke 15 tells us when the, the, the father comes out that he treasures his sons. He treasures his sons so much. He welcomes them, even the one who rejected him. He welcomes him back, throws a party, puts the cloak, puts the signet ring on his finger, tells them, you are my son in whom I am well pleased no matter where you've been or what you did. And even to the older son who tells him basically, you're treating me like a slave. That's his mentality of his relationship with his dad. Even then he says, all that I have is yours. Come and celebrate with me. Even someone that told their father right to his face, I don't want you, I just want your stuff. He says, all this is for you. Come and celebrate with me. How many of us would look at our child who says, you know what? I just can't wait for you to die. Would you say, hey, come on. I love you. Come celebrate with me. You would continue to give after hearing something like that. God gave us the greatest gift because he treasures you. How does he want you to know? He gave all these commandments and the law and the Old Testament and the fiery pillar of cloud, all these great, great moments of helping them escape from Egypt. And that wasn't enough to a people that, was fick, to the people that were fickle. So what did he do? For all, the beginning of time, he says, you know what? The only way they're going to get it is if I go to them myself. And he did through his son, Jesus. And Jesus preached, and he preached on the hill many, many uh, years before he was going to die for us on the cross that look at the lilies, look at the sparrows. God cares for all these, how much more we care for you. So seek first the kingdom. God cares for you, so that frees you up to seek him. Well, the cross is the epitome of the showcase of how much God cares for you. It's meant to unshackle you from pursuing life here, but actually pursuing life from or with God. So as we reflect on what Jesus did on the cross to show us a signpost of how much he treasures us, it's meant to free us to now treasure him rather than get caught up in the other things that are good and making them the ultimate thing. So a question for you. Yeah, I got a couple up here. Thanks. If you could have all the blessings and benefits that you desire from your faith without the need to pray or commune with God, would that appeal to you? Essentially, God, give me all the cool things that come from faith in you without really having to work for the relationship. Is that appealing? And can you think of any good thing in your life that is more important to you than God? Those are some important questions that I pose to us to think in fellowship and think about throughout the week. If you have a cup, please uh, bow your head with me and we'll, we'll pray for our time of communion. Lord in heaven, God, we come before you. Father, we know that you are a God that gives good gifts. We know you're a God that gives the ultimate gift, that you are so good. Father, we have pain and we have suffering. In our mind, in my heart, pain and suffering means something's wrong. I did something wrong. Someone else did something wrong. This shouldn't happen. And while that is true in many cases, God, this world of pain and suffering, the heartaches that we experience personally and the heartaches that we see throughout our world are meant to remind us that life can be found only in you, in your hand, in your spirit, and how it works, in your desire to make this world anew, and that it is coming one day. It's meant to free our hearts to pursue you and to trust you more. God, help us in this time of communion to recognize that you poured yourself out literally for us. To communicate to us, you treasure us. Even though we turned our backs on you, we went out and took what you gave us and we made it our own and lived to our own and we felt, felt like we had it made 
And then we fall short and we come back to you and you're there to welcome us. And we're like that older brother too, God, that we, we play the game of religion sometimes with you. We don't always want you and cherish you. We just want you to make our lives comfortable and great and what we want them to be without you. God, help us to repent and pursue life in the kingdom with you, walking with you everywhere we go. God, if we want our circumstances to change, help our circumstances not to supersede who you are. God, if our circumstances need to change and that you have great things in store for us, bring those to fruition. But help our hearts not to, to lose you in those blessings. God, we do pray that uh, we can experience life with you. Help the church here in Roanoke all the more continue to be a church that walks with you, loves you, pours themselves out, knowing that life is found in giving rather than receiving. Thank you for giving us your son. We pray all this in your son's name. Jesus Christ. Amen.